Welcome back. This is Dear Baseball Gods, episode 55, and I want to welcome you to the show today. We're going to talk about what I think is a pretty polarizing topic, which is should coaches call pitches for their pitchers? And uh, I have a pretty strong view of this, and I actually did an informal uh, Instagram poll the other day, and I think maybe like 500 people responded, and the uh, the overall was 75% said no, coaches should not call pitches, and 25% said yes. And uh, I know this is an extremely common practice, especially with college coaches. And, of course, in pro baseball, zero pitches are called from the dugout. So it's a uh, situation where there's a lot of, I guess, tradition now, and there's a lot of just like, oh, this is how it's done. And I don't know that calling pitches for pitchers is the way to go, and we're going to go on that tonight. So first thing I want to talk about, and this is what I spoke on at Sabre Seminar this uh, past month, the beginning of August, I spoke on pitch tunneling and how pitchers make their decisions. But before we talk about like whether pitch tunneling, and that's not the topic of this, this podcast, but before we could talk about whether pitch tunneling was a factor that a pitcher out there on the mound competing in a game would choose, you know, would he factor in pitch, uh, pitch tunneling? And in his little algorithm of why he chooses every single pitch is pitch tunneling in there. So before I could cover that in my lecture, I wanted to give my insight about how I think pitchers call pitches because uh, I don't know that anyone really thinks about it and it's a pretty complex thing that happens really, really quick. So uh, in, this, uh, in this, this talk, I basically said that what the output is for a pitcher is an expected outcome. So when, they, when you go through all of your processes, which I'm gonna go through now, uh, at the end, you sort of get like this Polaroid, like this snapshot of like what you think is as a pitcher is going to happen when you throw the pitch that you've committed to. So if I'm, you know, and, and here are the factors that we'll kind of go into. So number one, who you are as a pitcher. Are you an 88 mile per hour guy? Are you an 81 mile per hour guy? Are you a 72 mile per hour 13 year old? Do you throw 97? Do you have high spin rate, low spin rate? Are you a sinker slider guy? Are you a fastball curveball guy? Can you get a fastball guy by a guy? Can you not? Uh, what's the situation? Right? Is it bases loaded? Or is it a runner on third and two outs? You bases open. Do you not have bases open? Um, all these different factors of what kind of pitcher are you? That's number one. What kind of pitcher are you? How do you get your outs? And how do you do you know yourself what pitches you can make and what you can't? I was a arm side pitcher. I could pitch into righties all day with high success. I could throw strikes there. I was terrible throwing into lefties. I was not good at going away to, to righties. Um, I was a fastball curveball changeup guy. I threw a cutter for a couple of seasons. I toyed with a slider for a couple of seasons. So, but I figured out over time that the way I got hitters out was rather formulaic. I was aggressive early. Hitters wouldn't square up my fastball very well. I was aggressive early to get ahead in the count. I'd go in, I'd go up, I'd bounce breaking balls. That was pretty much me. And I pitched inside probably five to one for every pitch I'd throw away. So I just knew what I could do and what I couldn't. I know which pitches I could make, which is I pitches I couldn't. I know that I got hurt down the zone more than I got hurt up in the zone. And I very infrequently got hurt up in the zone. So with all those things, that was number one. And that's basically like, you know, say you're, you're a craftsman. Like, what tool am I holding in my hand? Like, you as a pitcher, what can you do and what can you not do? So if you have a hammer, can you drive a screw with that? No. Like, if, do you have a, if you have a hacksaw, can you cut through a tree with it? No. You have to know what you're capable as a pitcher, and that's a long journey in itself. That takes a long time to figure out what you can do. I don't think I knew myself as a pitcher until I was ugh, probably 25 I started to figure out, and then really at like 28, my last three seasons in the Atlantic League, that's when I really started to understand what I was good at because I had to really understand myself to be successful at all. So number one is what you, who you are as a pitcher. Number two is like the situation. What kind of outcome do you want? Is it early in the game? Is it early in the inning? Uh, is it first and second no one out? Do you really want a ground ball? Or does any out play just the same? Do you really need a strikeout? Who's up at bat comes after that? Is he a power guy? Is he a free swinger? Is he a smaller guy? Does he go opposite field? Does he kind of go to all fields? If you leave one over the plate, how hurt do you get? Do you give a home run? Is it a double? Or is it just like a line drive single? Uh, does the guy change his approach when he gets to two strikes? Does he hit breaking balls well? Does he hit breaking balls very poorly? Does he hit change-ups well? Like, what, is he, what do you know about him? What have your teammates in the bullpen said? And when they've talked to you about their scouting report about a, a, a hitter, do, does, does their arsenal play with yours? You know, if you talk to Raldis Chapman um, about his scouting report on someone, he's going to say that everyone in the world has a slow bat, and then you could throw a fastball by him, right? He's going to have a tough time giving 
actionable, like relatable advice to like Dallas Keuchel for the, from the Astros who throws 88 to 90, um, you know, like those scouting reports aren't going to match up in any way. So is there an actual formal scouting report? Like, is there a scout who's written these all up and says, hey, this guy generally he struggles with sliders, he struggles with uh, fastballs, he can't hit speed, he can't hit this, he can't hit that, he chases up, he chases down. What like, You take all this information in, all right? And then you combine that with other little things, like how does his swing look to you? Does his barrel look kind of loopy? Where do you think his bat lives in the zone? Is he a pitcher, a guy who can get to a pitch up? Does he have a hole in his swing that you can see? How far off the plate is he? Does that change at any point? Does he stride into the plate? Does he step in the bucket? Does he step? Now, things like that, they change. Like They're very, very subtle at high levels of baseball, but they're actually pretty obvious at low levels of baseball. So what, do you, what can you figure out? How well does your catcher know this guy? How well do you know this hitter? Have you ever faced him before? Does he ambush on the, Like There's just so many little variables and pieces of information. And you're taking in all of these, and then you're making, hopefully, just the best decision you can about, okay, I faced this guy before. I'm an arm side pitcher. I throw hard. It's the first pitch. It doesn't matter how I get him out as long as I get him out. I don't need a strikeout. I don't need a ground ball. I can be whatever. Uh, I faced him twice before, and I jammed him inside, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Just you, you put it all together, and you say, okay, after all things considered, I think fastball underneath his hands is the best pitch that I can throw, and that's what I'm going to throw. And then you get this Polaroid. You, you push the button, and it gives you this snapshot, and then you visualize yourself hitting that spot, and then you visualize getting the outcome that you're assuming you're going to get. You wouldn't throw a pitch in a spot that you assume he's going to hit a double, right? Like that, that makes no sense. Like why would you pick a pitch that you think he's going to hit a double on? You would never do that. So whatever result that is that you think you're going to get, that's sort of like what plays in your head for this little, you know, like five second movie. You get your Polaroid and your movie, whatever you want to call it, uh, your little snapshot of what you think is going to happen when you hit your spot. And then you're committed. You're like, okay, let's do this. I think I got the right pitch. And you throw it and you see what happens, right? So you hit your spot and he fouls it off or you miss completely on the other side of the plate and he drives it in the gap or he fouls it off or he takes it or he like barely even moves and just takes it. Uh, or he fouls it straight back or he fouls it off really early. He ambushed you or he fouled it off late. And now you have new information to fold into all the other things, right? So you have new information. How did he swing on that last pitch? Uh, did he ambush me? Does it look like he has a plan? Does it look like he's trying to take me deep? Does it look like he's trying to just punch him to the right side? Does it look like he's trying to give himself up to get the runner from second to third? What does it look like he was trying to do with that swing? Where was his barrel? Where were his hands? Where was his stride? Um, all those different factors. And they, and they get computed lightning fast because obviously you're not standing out there mountain blabbering on like I am. And so with all that, you decide, okay, now we're 0-1. Uh, I'm going to throw slider away. Now, when you're young, you don't know super well how to do everything that I just talked about. Like all that that I just talked about happens in like four seconds, maybe. And so uh, when that's the case, the game gets really fast when you're trying to like compute that much data at once. So the longer you do this and the longer you have this experience, the more you're watching, the more you see cause and effect, the better and the faster you can compute all that information and make a quick but still sound decision and this term the game is or he's sped up or the game's speeding up on him that's when the game is going too fast for a player to like figure out he can make the right decision right for example you know a kid plays high school baseball goes to college you know his first day in division one baseball guy hits a routine ground he's playing shortstop hits a routine ground ball at him at shortstop the guy feels it like he always has looks up and the hitter's like almost to first base and he panics and throws in the outfield that's a good example of the game speeding up on you literally because the hitters are so much faster that he just like didn't realize that he had to like move everything quicker and b as soon as he realized it that oh crap i, sh I should have given gotten rid of the ball by now he doesn't know how what to do and he like thinks through his delivery and throws the ball in the, in the stands that's just like one example um basically just like all this stuff when you feel the game spiraling out of control Bases are loaded. You have fans in the stands. Like you shift into pro ball from like from my college, we had 50 parents come to a game. And then my first game I ever pitched in pro ball, there was 6,000 fans there. You know, and when you fall behind or you get into a jam, suddenly you hear all the crowd and you're like, oh my god, like it just like you start to freak out. And then because you're focused on outside factors, you struggle to make 
good pitches and make good decisions and you don't know where you're supposed to go with the ball. Suddenly you get a comebacker and you, and you like weren't ready for it. You never even thought about it. And now you're like, where does this go? Do I go home? Do I go to second? Like, and then you throw it away or you just like, those things happen. So the point is how do we then get better at making these fast decisions considering the vast amount of data um, that it goes into a single pitch call. Because what I tell my pitchers that I work with is they should have a good reason for every single pitch that they throw. And there's going to be a, still a lot of times when they have no real information. Like they're facing a brand new kid who's got like a pretty average stance. They've never seen this team before. They've never faced this player before. It's not an exceptional situation. It's like the second inning and no one out. Uh, and they don't like they have no nothing to go by. And so when they have no like other information to go by, no scouting reports, no like I've seen his swing, any of that, then there's still a good reason, which is, well, I decided to go first pitch fastball down the middle because I really wanted him to swing and I wanted to compete and I wanted to get ahead in the count. That's a good answer still. Or, hey, I didn't know what to throw, pitch to throw, so my slider's pretty dirty, so I chose to throw a slider because I'm confident in it. That's still a good reason. Now, when pitchers say, oh, I was just trying to mix it up, you know, I just, I wanted to like change speeds. I didn't want him to think about, I didn't want the hitter to think I was doing this. Or When they start to get too theoretical, when they don't have anything tangible to go by, like I did this because I'm good at this, or I did this because I'm not good at this, or I, I didn't think I could make that pitch, so I chose this pitch. Uh, when it's just like, oh, I just want to mix it up, or, or I don't know. I get lots of blank stares. It's like, uh, I don't really know. I just felt, I just thought I'd throw that pitch. Um, if you talk to a high-level pitcher, they'll have an answer for every pitch that they throw. Oh, yeah, I threw that, that one one change up because I figured if he swings at it, he rolls over, and if he doesn't uh, and it's close, you know, and it's a ball, I could still go in with a fastball next and probably, you know, bust him and get a ground ball. Like, there's always, there's always like a couple pitches ahead. And, again, there's always a reason for what they're doing. So I want to have a quick thought experiment. So imagine – you are you, you're a pitcher, even if you're not a pitcher listening to this podcast, imagine that you're a pitcher, you're out there on the mound, and imagine whatever repertoire you have, say you're 84 miles per hour, you throw a slider and a curveball, your command is average, you're six foot seven, so you're giant, uh, whatever it is, and if you're you, then just be you, <laughs> so um, you're on the mound, and you pitch the first inning, and you go into the dugout, now the next inning, you swap bodies with another pitcher, and you go back out there to the mound, so now, you're still your, your mind, but now you're in a body of a kid who's 5'6", throws 94 miles per hour with a filthy slider. What pitches do you call? Right? Okay, now you get through that inning. Now you go into the dugout. Now you come back out. Now you're a, you throw a 76 from submarine. You throw a changeup and a, uh, and, a, and a slider, like a frisbee slider. Uh, not that good. What pitches do you call? Now you go into the dugout and you come back out. Now you're, uh, you throw 91, 92. You're like iron mic arm slot. You're a big four-seamer, like Barry Zito curveball guy. How do you approach the first hitter? And say you go back and forth and you do this for nine innings. You have a new body. You're a new person every time. Like, do you have a good idea of how you're going to pitch to any given hitter in that game? Do you know what you're going to do when you get into a jam? Now, say, instead of staring from the mound to the plate, you have to look at a mirror at the dugout to get your sign and you have to look at the, uh, the hitter exclusively through this mirror that reflects off the dugout and then goes back towards the plate from the side. So basically you have the view of the, of the, the coach. Uh, so you don't get, when you throw your pitch, you know, you like, you close your eyes. Again, this is hypothetical. You close your eyes and you pick up the, the happening of the bat, the event of the bat. So whether he, str- he swings, takes, fouls, puts it in play, you have to get all of your information by looking into the dugout off this mirror which then reflects back to the plate. How comfortable do you feel uh, making informed decisions about, A, what pitches you're going to throw given that you're a new pitcher each time, and B, the fact that your point of view is from the dugout? Do you feel great about, you know, now there's a seventh inning guy? Do you feel like you know what to throw? And I thought a lot about this, and I feel like that's some, obviously it's weird, but that's somewhat analogous to what the coach is doing when he's calling pitches for all of his players in the field. He's got a horrible point of view. He can see the side of the catcher, the side of the hitter, and the side of the pitcher. I know I've watched thousands of baseball games from the dugout, and I cannot tell when a pitcher misses just off the plate or just on the plate. I cannot tell lateral location. I can tell vertical location. I cannot really tell. You have to, like, deduce 
uh, lateral location. It's like imply. Like, oh, was, where was the catcher set up? And even then, you can't tell exactly from the side because you're in the dugout. Uh, and then how much does his mitt move, right? So information from the dugout is extremely incomplete, very incomplete. You can only tell so much because you're facing the side. Now, you could say the same thing from the pitcher because you're only facing one way, but you're watching him swing at you. You're watching his hips turn. You're watching his barrel, barrel come through. You're seeing all of it. And the catcher is right there, basically with the rear view, seeing the same thing. He's watching his feet. He's right up close, all this sort of stuff. But yet... Coaches say that they're better at calling a game from the dugout, 70 feet away, 50 feet away, however far the dugout is, is away, uh, with this weird view where they can't tell lateral location very well, and uh, with a different pitcher, you know, every couple innings, sometimes, you know, starter goes six, and it's three different pitchers after that, they automatically know what pitches that pitcher can make and what pitches he's good at and how he feels and what he's confident in. They're just calling stuff. And I don't think you could possibly argue that, that, that they're going to make the best decisions even if they have much more experience than the pitcher and catcher. So number one, it's kind of like looking through a keyhole. Like they have very limited information, which I, I mean, just imagine like if Joe Madden in the World Series for the Cubs called all the pitches in the last inning and, and you know, the, the Cubs lost. It would just be like, it would be ridiculous. It would be unthinkable for people like, you're going to call pitches from there? Like, they would bring up all these points that I just really brought up. Like, how could you not trust his point of view and his point of view and blah, blah, blah. Now, Joe Madden has 20 years more experience than these major leaguers do. You know, Clayton Kershaw came up as a rookie and was a second, third, fourth year player. Every person in that dugout had more experience than him. They didn't call the game for him. Why not? They had, they had more experience at the highest level of the game, and they still don't call it for guys who are way below it. But yet, in the college ranks, they call ton, They call pitches of, like the vast majority of programs. They call tons of pitches at the high school level. They just call it all the time in amateur baseball. Why, why do these coaches have so much more valuable experience that these players can't do it? Now, granted, when you're in the major leagues, you've had 20 years of baseball. So when Clayton Kershaw was a major leaguer for the first, you know, his rookie year, he was... 21 or something he'd been playing baseball since he was eight he had 13 years of experience whereas if you're 12 you've only been playing baseball for four years or five years so granted there's a thing there however um we'll get we'll get more to that in a second but first here's the reasons that i hear that coaches call pitches number one their job's on the line so if you're a big division one coach you make six figures you make up to i think some guys are getting close to seven figures now so their job is on the line, and they're obviously heavily invested in winning. Same thing with pro, pro coaches, although pro coaches do not, uh, managers do not call games for their pitchers. So in college, there's a vested interest in a college coach saying, I'm not going to let this 19-year-old kid, uh, you know, ruin my paycheck. You know, I make 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month, 30 grand a month. Uh, I'm not going to let his poor decision-making uh, affect my career, Okay somewhat valid. Um, the coach is also a part of the team, right? The coach is a part of the team. Uh, he's not a player, but he's supposed to help the team win. So he should do things within his power to help the team win. Seems relatively valid. Um, I also often hear that, oh, I call pitches for my team because my pitcher doesn't know how to call a game. Like he calls a terrible game or my pitcher's really stupid or my catcher has no idea how to call a game. Um, and then lastly, the biggest thing, and I learned I had coaches that called pitches for me, including most of the time in college, which I butt heads with them about, uh, and also uh, sometimes in summer ball. But most of these coaches, well, not most, but some of them, they rationalize it by saying, oh, well, I explain it. You know, if they shake me off, they can shake me off. Uh, but if they shake me off, like we're going to talk about it and I'll explain why I called this and why I called that. And uh, so, yeah, so those are, I feel like, the main reasons, you're right? Coaches, jobs on the line. It's, it's a contribution for them to help the team win. Uh, you know, the pitcher or catcher are less experienced, uh, which I already don't think is a very valid reason because everyone's less experienced than the coach by default. Uh, and then obviously like, oh, we, we are, I'm helping them learn it by doing it. But in most things in life, I don't think that's really how it works. So we'll cover that one first. So I'll give you a quick story. I was pitching against the Somerset Patriots. This was, I think, my comeback year or the year after. It's kind of blurry. I think it was 2014. Uh, I was pitching the ninth. It was a tie game. And uh, so 
Brian Barden, who was a former big leaguer, came up. And I had the I had allowed I got an out and I'd allow the the winning run to go to second base. Again, we were on the road, so this is the bottom of the ninth. And uh, the winning run was on second. Very, very fast guy. So I knew he would score on any base hit. Single, double, triple home run. They're all equal. Like they're gonna the game's gonna be over. So I'd faced Barton a couple times, and uh, I'd struck him out before. He had kind of a slow bat, even though I knew he played in the majors, so that comes with a lot of clout. Like, you know in someone's history, you're like, wow, he like, performed at the highest level ever. Um, but I'd struck him out a couple times. I knew he'd chase fastballs, he'd chase up, and he just, like, struggled to kind of get to my fastball. So I'd seen him a couple times, and on this occasion, I was 1-2, and I was, like, throwing fastballs at the letters, trying to get him to pop up or strike out. He was spraying balls in his dugout, like super late. His teammates are ducking for cover, and the bat starts to get the bat starts to get long. And I'm just throwing fastball, 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 fastball. And there's the angel and the devil on my shoulder, and they're kind of talking, and uh, they're like, ah, you know, how many fastballs can you throw this guy? He pitched in the big leagues. He's gonna make an adjustment, and all he has to do is just like shorten up and punch it through the the three four hole, and the game's over, right? Ground ball to the right side, and gets through, and that's it. And uh, and then on the other shoulder it's like well he hasn't adjusted yet he's like fouling balls he's like way late and you've blown it by him before um I didn't know and finally I decided that I was going to make an adjustment before he adjusted to me because I was worried that he was just going to like shorten up and just boop and then people are gonna be like Dan you're stupid you can't throw this guy eight fastballs in a row he like played in the big leagues and so I throw curveball and naturally I throw it right down the middle and he just blasts a game losing two run home run over the second set of fences, you know, there's two, two layers of advertisements and the alpha just destroyed it, like 430 feet probably. And I came in and my teammates were pissed at me. And, they, and I remember this, I'll remember this till I die, because they just basically just told me I was stupid. They're like, why would you throw him that pitch? And I explained the exact reason I explained to you. And, I, and they're like, no, he was telling you that he couldn't adjust. He was obviously not adjusting. He kept fouling balls late, late, late. There was no, like, he was getting close. He was just as late as the previous one on each subsequent fastball. And I said, okay. Uh, and it was a learning situation where I had known this, and I had told pitchers I worked with. I, had, I mean, in general, I made a pretty good pitch call the vast, vast, vast majority of the time. I was getting pretty smart at this age. I was 28 or 29. And, uh, and yet there... I chose theoretical, like I'll adjust before he adjusts, even though the, the, the data in front of me is saying, don't change pitches. He's too slow on your fastball. Don't change pitches. If you go slower, you throw a slower pitch to him, he's going to be on time. And so I did. I chose theoretical instead of actual. So you could say that, oh, well, the coach, the guys on the dugout saw what you didn't see. Like if they had called your pitches there, they would have kept calling fastballs. It could have been avoided. Okay. Uh, but for me as a pitcher developing – which developmental baseball is the only version of baseball uh, for almost everyone because most guys will never make it out of high school baseball and most guys who play college baseball will not make it to the pros. So it's pretty much developmental baseball forever. Uh, you're trying to build character values and you're trying to teach kids the right way to play the game and by playing the right way and, and being good teammates and hustling, you're producing better human beings. Uh, and of course, we all want to win, but... Uh, when you're trying to produce kids who continually, continually get better at baseball every year, you want them to have chances to fail and develop. But yet when we call pitches, we're stealing that chance from them. Because if someone had called that at bat for me, whether they called the same pitches I chose or they called better pitches that got me out of that inning, I wouldn't have had that experience that haunted me and forced me to think even harder about every subsequent pitch that I threw for the rest of my career. I never wanted that thing to happen again. What happened that night was just like cripplingly embarrassing. Cripplingly, clearly not a word, but it was at the end of like a two week slump. It was like the last straw. I was like absolutely furious. Uh, I just was just like, and the fact that they insulted my intelligence, I'm, I'm proud that I, I'm an intelligent baseball player. I, it just, everything about it just like stung super hard. Obviously it was a walk off home run on the road on like a Friday night. Uh, so the fans just loved it. It was just like the trifecta of just horrible, horrible experiences. And it made me a vastly better baseball player and a vastly smarter pitcher because that happened. And if someone had called the game or if I had just made a better pitch, like those little junctions in life are what make you better. You have to stumble, you have to fail and rise up against it 
and not be crippled out there trying to, oh, God, what pitch do I, cho- do I choose? But look, I just have to think harder. I just, have to, I just have to focus better. I have to watch these hitters more intently to understand what and have a better chance of making the best decision I possibly can. So, you know, in a situation like that, it needs to be, the pitcher needs to be allowed to fail on that. And so, all right, I get the coach's job was on the line. You know, if that's the reasoning, it's a selfish reason. It's a selfish reason that his job is on the line, so he's going to take it out of your hands so that you don't screw up because for him. And when pitchers and catchers don't know how to call a game, that's also completely and utterly on the coach. To He's got he's to teach you. It's, you know, if you, if you listen or read the great book, Extreme Ownership, by the two former Navy SEALs, uh, Leif Babin and Jocko Willink, they talk about how, I mean, the whole book is based on the idea that as a leader, it is your job to take full ownership of any failures that you have because it is your job to make sure everyone below you in the command ranks knows exactly what they should be doing. And it's your job to either completely and utterly and perfectly explain that to them so they know exactly what they need to do at every point. And if they can't do it, you get rid of them. But if they can, but if you could have explained it better, you could have made it more clear for your soldier to have taken the right path to be right where he needed to be when the battle started or whatever it was, uh, you could have always done something better to make it more clear to your employees, to the people underneath you, to your players on your team. You could have done things better to make sure that any negative outcome didn't happen. So if you're afraid that your pitcher is going to screw a game up and you're going to lose your job because of it, why aren't you spending more time off the field teaching your kids how to call games? They're not idiots. Like even the dumbest players I've played with have a very high IQ for like either a kinesthetic IQ or just they, they, they know how to compete. They know how to play baseball. And these guys are excited to learn for the most part. There are still some, there's a whole continuum of intelligences in sports, but you, it's, it's, a, it's a lame, pathetic excuse to say they can't call a good game, so therefore I'm going to call it for them. Spend more time with them and take responsibility yourself as a coach because if you can't take responsibility that your pitcher doesn't know how to call a good game, then you should have taught him better. And that goes for me too. I spent a lot of time with my pitcher and catcher this past summer, and I spent time with, well, all three, of my, all three of my catchers and our pitchers, but I certainly could have spent more time. And the, the times when we made poor pitch decisions, we talked about in the dugout. But we also, we could have spent a lot more time in the offseason being better at it. I absolutely could have. So if you're a high school coach or you're a youth coach, I realize there's only so much time in the day. It's a volunteer job. It's long hours as it is. Like, there's only so much you can do. So I'm really not speaking to you. But for the college coaches, I'm definitely speaking to you. If you say that your pitchers or catchers are not qualified to call a good game, then you're pathetic and you're not spending enough time teaching them that. I mean, that's just the bottom line. You're not spending the time teaching them that. If they can't go out there and understand just the basics, how speed changes based on outside versus inside versus up versus down, understanding what pitches, and I'm talking about like effective velocity, perceived speed, right? Fastballs that are away to a hitter appear a little bit slower. The back can stay in the zone longer and still make good contact. Or uh, they can hit the ball deeper on the plate and make good contact. When the ball's in the inner part of the plate, they have to get the barrel out farther to make barrel contact, right? So it seems effectively faster. Pitches up are tougher to get the barrel to. Pitches down, a lot of times hitters can drop their hands to. Understanding each pitcher's strengths and weaknesses, understanding what spin rate does for some pitchers, understanding just like cause and effect, teaching them how to read foul balls. Like all these are very, very basic. How margin of error changes with, with the count and the strike zone. Um, it's not super complex to give a very strong foundation of pitch calling. It just isn't. It's not that complex. Now, all the little nuances that we talked about, like reading a swing and reading a foul ball and, and all that stuff, it takes a lot of time. And maybe they can't do it because they have so much other info to process because they're only a freshman in college or only a sophomore in college or only a 16-year-old sophomore in high school or whatever it is. Uh, but there's, there's just still plenty of room for them to be taught how to call a reasonable game especially considering some of these other factors that I want to talk about. Number one, pitchers don't hit their spots most of the time. So as a coach, why do you have to control and call every single pitch when they're going to miss their spots most of the time anyway? You know, we were playing a 14-U team, and the coach screamed out 
the three numbers so the catcher could look at his little wrist guard. Three, two, two. Every pitch of the entire game, besides it just being irritating and obnoxious, this kid was throwing almost all fastballs. Like almost all fastballs. So what are we what are we calling? You know, and, and, and as a 14-year-old kid, I know how many strikes 14-year-old kids throw. Like not that many. And when they do throw 60 plus percent strikes, which is good for 14, uh, they're still not hitting their spot. They're just throwing strikes. They have control, which is very different than command. Control is just the ability to throw strikes consistently. Command is the ability to throw the ball where you want it consistently within a whatever grouping, you know, in the major leagues, the grouping might be this big, it might be like cantaloupe and command the college level might be a volleyball, whatever. Um, but it's just all control. So if it's youth baseball, like I have, I didn't call pitches for my team. And even if I had, I only had maybe two pitchers that could execute. It's like, why am I going to call pitches? They're just going to throw strikes or they're not. And if they do throw strikes, the odds they hit the spot where then we can set them up and move the ball around, mostly relevant. So, you know, from the, the amateur ranks below college, you know, 10 to 18, they're just trying to throw strikes. And, it's, you know, like especially 10 to 14, 9 to 14, they're obviously there's kids young, younger than that age. But, uh, you know, at 9U, I think they start co- uh, kid pitch most of the time. So 9 to 14U, they're just like the vast majority of kids we saw were just fastballs. And very few, th- very few kids throw change-ups, depending on the, where you are in the country and how they're taught. There's some kids that throw a lot of curveballs at those young ages, but still, um, it's still a mostly a fastball game, or it's just a two-pitch game. And kids don't hit off-speed stuff that well, so you don't have to have some like crazy good reason or rocket science to, to do it. But you would rather have kids out there at that age just taking the chance and taking the responsibility on themselves where it's like, hey, I want you to think through the game. If you see them swing a little bit late, go in. If you see them like pretty early or they're like a bigger hitter or whatever, then go away because hits are going to roll over a lot. If you see them like step in the bucket, you see their hips kind of fly open. They're really loopy, like throw away, whatever it is. However you want to decide to teach them, just teach them. It's so basic at their ages, and the hitter's swings are so ugly, and they're on time, they're off time. They just have like no idea what they're doing. They're figuring out their, their bodies at that age. So to call a game at 14U and below, it's just like, I would if I were to call pitches, I'd say, throw a strike, throw a strike, throw a strike. I don't care what pitch they throw, just throw just throw strikes and be aggressive and compete in the middle of the zone. And when you get ahead, move towards the peripheral of the strike zone, move towards the edges a little more. That's all the pitching is at youth baseball. So why we're calling pitches for that? Just like it doesn't make sense. You know, and if they're learning this new pitch, this curveball or this changeup, let them learn it for real. Like let them throw it, let them throw it. 0-2 to a guy who's got a slow bat and the guy take him deep. And then you go, hey, what, what happened? When you throw a slow pitch to a guy who's like laying on your fastball, oh, he took me deep. They'll learn so much more at that point. And again, this is the utmost of developmental baseball. So when it's, it's developmental baseball, you have to have them learn these lessons. You need them to get burned by all sorts of things before they really figure it out. You know, and sometimes they have to get burned a couple of times. You have to pull them from the game before they figure it out. But especially at that age, there's just like nothing to call. And there's also just all the learning opportunities in the world that are going to be better learned when they fail. And then from like high school age and up, high school age, they're adding two more pitches. Now they're really relying on their curveball. They're really relying on their slider. They're really relying on their changeup. And it's a challenge to throw all those three pitches for strikes, right? So sure, you could say, oh, like this is the perfect time. But the kids are so, their percentages, you know, if you're a pro guy, you're going to throw your fastball first strike 75% of the time probably. Uh, if you need, if you wanted to throw for a strike, you'd probably throw your off speed stuff 60% of the time, something like that. And they'd all kind of average out to like 65% range. So that's to the point where, yeah, like you, I can like reliably call a certain pitch and, and he has a reliable chance of executing on it, right? He could throw that curveball for a strike or he could throw that curveball in the dirt. But in high school, there's still they're still just like maybe like 30%, 40%, 50% strikes for the curveball same for their changeup, uh, maybe 60% strikes for their fastball. And maybe I'm under, obviously there's still a continuum. There's because a great command and, but on the whole command's not that good. So why not let them learn on their own when they're just not going to hit spots anyway? So what, what am I going to call it? Fastball in fastball away. You know, like if hitters got a slow bat, like 
talk to your kids more, teach them better and say, look, this kid's got a really slow bat. Probably when you get ahead in the count, uh, we want to go hard, hard in, hard up. Or he's, this kid just like looks terrible on a curveball. Like read that. He looks terrible. Kids are going to just show their weaknesses so much more obviously at the high school level and the youth level where it's just like, hey, do you see how ugly that swing is? Just repeat it. When you see a swing that ugly, just repeat it. Just like give them the reins. They can do it. Like I promise them they can do it. And, uh, and the other thing is like how good are these coaches at calling pitches? Like they're not all miracle workers, right? Like I'm a pretty smart guy. And I wasn't that smart of a pitcher until I was like probably 26, 27, 28. And even then, I had a lot of guys at the high level who were a lot smarter than I was. And uh, I'm not going to say like, oh, I'm like a million times smarter than all these coaches. But I'm a lot smarter calling pitches than a lot of these guys ever were. And most of them probably didn't either either make it out of high school baseball or college baseball or they were low-level pro guys. And uh, why are we assuming that they're like these gods of pitch calling? Why would you assume that I'm going to call a good pitch from the dugout? I have this terrible vantage point. I don't know your stuff. I don't know that you're uncomfortable throwing your changeup. I don't know that you're like, you don't feel good about your slider today, but I'm going to call it because I theoretically think that it's the right pitch. It's like, it takes too much communication for me to like know you and like be in your body. I should just let you do it right. And teach you how to do it and just let you do it. When you fail, I'll just tell you maybe what I thought. Um, and you can still say like, no, like, I, I really trusted my slider there. I can be like, okay, because at the end of the day, you have to pitch with conviction. And the worst thing is when the worst thing is when a catcher calls the opposite pitch that you call, because that in the, in the decision-making process, like you get your Polaroid, like I've, I've decided it's like fastball, fastball low and away. And then the catcher puts fastball in. You're like, wait, what I miss? Wait, wait why did he pick the exact opposite? Or I, I swear I should be throwing a, a slider here. Why is he calling fastball? Because then you just second guess yourself. And then you don't have conviction. You're like, what did I miss? Did I miss everything? Like, you know, I, after that, that home run that I gave, I could have been like second guessing myself all the time, like thinking, oh, I should just let my catcher do it. Then I take the responsibility off myself. And that's another thing that I hate about pitch calling. And it's the thing that I butted heads with my coaches in college about. I was like, these are my numbers. This is my career. I don't want to throw your pitch. I want to go down swinging with my pitch. You know, you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, when I gave that home run, I chose that. And I took responsibility for it. Whether I win or lose, like I want the responsibility. I think it's one of the things coaches over and over and over, they want kids that don't make excuses, right? But then yet we take the power out of their hands. You know, it's like, I don't want him to think too much. He thinks too much. So I'm going to call the pitches for him. Screw that. He's got to figure out how to like not think so much at some point. And if he gets the pro ball, which is everyone kid's kid's goal, he's going to have to do it then. And now he's going to be completely incapable of it. So there's just this incongruence with, are we building kids up to be better? Are we building kids towards college and pro baseball? Are we helping them reach their goals? If we are, how is this disconnect? Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for you. You know, this is like, if you're in a, you know, like a, a, like a, a kitchen or say you worked at like a cake shop and you're an apprentice and they'll, they'll let you watch like the head chef, like make all the cakes for years and years and years. But you can't actually make them. You can watch them. So you like know exactly what to do, but you've never done it. Like you're not going to be as good with, like you have to learn how to whisk. Like, you have to learn how to do all these, these little techniques. Like they, they take practice. Everything takes practice. You can't just watch it being done and then expect it to be ready to go. I mean, you know, how many guys get bounced out of pro ball because the game they call is garbage or because they're calling their coach's game and their coach wasn't that good at calling a game, but now they're in pro ball, but against where every hitter is a three hitter, you know, and, and in college, the best couple of hitters you'll face in a lineup, that's every hitter in a pro lineup. So now you're facing this great competition. You're on your own suddenly. Do you trust your catcher? Do you trust you? Do you know how to call a game? And obviously we're not building, like most kids are never going to play pro baseball, but like what are, what is our goal as a coach? Because if it comes back to your job security as a coach, that's a really selfish, like why are you kind of coaching kind of thing. And if you're a college at a high level college program and you're trying to get guys to pro ball, uh, like, why are you taking that skill out of their hands? Like, why are you not teaching them? Especially the high-level programs, you have so many resources. You have so much time. You can make them be in a pitcher and catcher pitch calling meeting anytime you want, and they have to be there. If they don't show up, kick them out of your program. But it's up to you to teach them that. And you just, seems like a lot of you just don't. And, you know, from my soapbox, I'm certainly not a perfect coach. Like, I'm definitely not. Um, and there's definitely a lot of coaches better than me. But this just is like an obvious disconnect 
that unless it's just this pure like job security selfishness and like we have to win and I'm going to control for the pitcher kind of win, it just like it doesn't make sense. You're like if, Especially if it's a young kid, freshman, sophomore, they're going to learn and they're going to be a better junior, senior leader on your team because they've had these hard knocks and these experiences and they're going to have them anyway. You can call the pitches, you know, and like there's so many programs in the country, high school, college, youth, wherever, coaches are calling the pitches and they're getting shelled, right? I mean, it's not like you have team, you know, 100 teams, coaches call them and their ERA is three. And then you have 100 other teams and the, and the players call them and the ERA is five. I would almost guarantee there's no, there's no statistical significance between the, the quality of a team's ERA and whether a coach calls the pitches or not. Because it's, it's always going to come down to the pitcher's conviction, their mound presence, their stuff, uh, their execution. So you can call the wrong pitch at 17U baseball. If you execute it, it's still going to be a good pitch. It always comes down to quality of pitch and execution. And uh, until you get to the really high levels, choosing the wrong pitch doesn't matter that much. Like, I had a good curveball, like a really, really sharp good curveball. And uh, if I'm in college and I throw that pitch to that same guy in that same situation, that same ninth inning, he might freeze and strike out because my curveball is really good. But at the very high levels, those guys can hit curveballs like that. And so, you know, like, you don't – it's just a situation where – I don't think that that happens in any other sport. Like, obviously, they call plays in football, but uh, the whole team executes on it, and they all understand what they're doing. But why this one player in baseball gets his responsibility taken away, uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. It just, again, I know coaches just, like, they pull their hair out about kids who make excuses, who don't take personal responsibility, who blame other people. But then you put them in a situation where you don't want them to take responsibility. Or I give a home run throwing the slider that my coach wanted me to throw because I want to throw a fastball. I give a home run. It's like, well, screw that. Like, why, why couldn't, like, you know, and I've been there. I've given up those hits and those, those doubles and home runs. I've given them up on pitches that I didn't want to throw. And when you throw pitches that you don't have conviction on, it's, it's just the worst. Like, I didn't want to throw that pitch, and it got destroyed. Like, what am I doing? Like, this is my career. It's my ERA. I'm out here on the mound putting myself in a very vulnerable position. Pitching is hard. Everyone's watching you. You screw the game up or you give your chance, team a chance to win. I and mean, that's just how it comes down to it. And uh, to take that from a pitcher, it just I don't see enough in the, pro to, in the pro pitch calling column to make that as widely as accepted as it is. I just really don't. And uh, I think that's it. I think that's all I got. But anyway... Leave me a response. If you want to leave me an irate email about why pitch calling is great, feel free to do it. Uh, if you want to leave me a response that says, hey, I think you're right, feel free to do it. Uh, if you fall somewhere in between, it doesn't really matter to me. But um, it's just a strange practice that seems more traditional than anything. And I don't know this was – it wasn't tradition back in the day because kids used to play Sandlot baseball, and they used to call their own pitches and – bean kids and do all this crazy stuff they learned baseball they learned baseball by playing baseball and they seemingly had higher baseball cues back then than they do now and part of that problem is probably that we're obsessed with velocity we're obsessed with the radar gun coaches are calling all the pitches so where is a pitcher to build his baseball iq i don't know good question maybe we'll have an answer either way we'll see you next time on dear baseball gods